Once again, now you're back on the savanna. It's not dawn this time, but you are looking at one of the magnificent things of the natural world, which is the migration of zebras throughout East Africa. A herd of two million of them migrate around following a cyclical pattern of rains. So they're always going where the grass is greener. So you've got this wonderful herd of two million wildebeest and there's a problem, which is there's some great field right in front of them full of grass and Bummer, there's a river in between them and the next field. And especially a bummer, a river teeming with crocodiles just ready to grab them. So what are the wildebeest going to do? And in, according to the National Geographic type specials we would get, out would come a solution. There's all the wildebeest hemming and hawing in this agitated state by the end, edge of the river. And suddenly, from the back of the crowd, comes this elderly wildebeest who pushes his way up to the front, stands on the edge of the river, and says, I sacrifice myself for you, mine kinder, and throws himself into the river, where immediately the crocs get busy eating him up, and the other two million wildebeest could tiptoe around the other way across the river and everybody's fine. And you're then saying, why'd this guy do this? Why did this guy fling himself into the river? And we would always get the answer at that point. The answer that is permeated as like the worst urban myth of evolution, whatever. Why did he do that? Because animals behave for the good of the species. This is the notion that has to be completely trashed right now. Animals behaving for the good of the species really came to the forefront. A guy in the early 60s named Wynne Edwards, hyphenated Wynne Edwards, some hyphenated Brit zoologist who pushed most strongly this notion of that animals behave for the you know, good of the species. He is reviled throughout every textbook. Win Edwards and group selection, that would be the term, selection for the good of groups, for the selection for the good of the species. Win Edward and group selection, I'm sure the guy did all sorts of other useful things, and anyone who really is has any depth to them would find out that all I know is that the guy is the one who came up with group selection. Animals behave for the good of the species. This isn't the case at all. Animals behave for passing on as many copies of their genes as possible. And what we'll see is when you start looking at the nuances of that, sometimes it may look like behaving for the good of the species, but it really isn't the case. So animals behave in order to maximize the number of copies of genes they leave in the next generation. Remember, not survival of the fittest, reproduction of the fittest. So first thing you need to do is go back to that vignette and say, uh, so what's up with the wildebeest there? And what's up with the elderly guy who jumps in the river? And finally, when you look at them long enough, instead of the camera crew showing up for three minutes, when you study this closely enough, you see something that wasn't apparent at first, which is this elderly wildebeest is not fighting his way through the crowd. This guy is being pushed from behind. <laughs> this guy is being pushed from behind because all the other ones are saying, yeah, get the old guy on the river. <laughs> sacrificing himself. My ass, this guy is getting pushed in by everybody else. He is not sacrificing himself for the good of the species. He does not like the idea of this whatsoever. So he gets pushed in because the old weak guy, none of this group selection stuff. What came in by the 70s as a replacement, a way to think about this, is this notion of animals, including us, behaving not for the good of the species of the group, but to maximize number of copies of genes left in the next generation. And what you see is three ways in which this could occur, three building blocks. The first one being known as individual selection. The first one built around the notion that sometimes the behavior of an animal is meant to optimize the number of copies of its genes that it leaves in the next generation by itself reproducing. The drive to reproduce, the drive to leave more copies of one's genes, this was once summarized really sort of tersely as sometimes a chicken is an egg's way of making another chicken. No, that's backwards. Sometimes a chicken is an egg's way of making another egg. OK, ignore that. Sometimes, what the guy said is, sometimes a chicken is an egg's way of making another egg. All this behavior stuff and all this animate sort of social interaction is just an epiphenomenon to get more copies of the genes into the next generation. 
individual selection. A subset of way of thinking about this is selfish genes. What behavior is about is maximizing number of copies of genes in the next generation. And sometimes the best way to do it, sometimes the way that animals maximize, is to get as many copies by way of reproducing themselves. It's not quite equivalent to a selfish gene, but for our purposes, individual selection. And this can play out in a number of realms and bringing in sort of a big dichotomy in thinking about evolutionary pressures. Darwin and the theory of natural selection. What natural selection is about is processes bringing about an organism who is more adaptive, what we just went through. Darwin soon recognized there was a second realm of selection, which he called sexual selection. And what that one's about is this is selecting for traits that have no value whatsoever in terms of survival or anything like that. Traits that carry no adaptive value, but for some random bizarro reason, the opposite sex likes folks who look this way. So they get to leave more copies of their genes. And suddenly, you could have natural selection bringing about big, sharp antlers and male moose, and they use that for fighting off predators or fighting with other male. That would be natural selection. Sexual selection might account for the fact that like the antlers are green paisley patterns all over for that. And for some reason, that looks cool to female moose, mooses. And what you wind up getting as a mechanism for sexual selection is as long as individuals prefer to mate with individuals with some completely arbitrary traits, those traits will also become more common. So this dichotomy of natural selection for traits driven by traits that really do aid leaving copies of genes outside the realm of just sheer sexual preference, sexual selection. And sometimes they can go in absolutely opposite directions. You can get some species where the female fish prefer male fish that have very bright coloration, and that's advantageous then to have the bright coloration by means of sexual selection. But the bright coloration makes you more likely to get predated by some other fish, natural selection pushing against the bright coloration in males. Very often, you've got the two going against each other, having to balance. So how would that be applied in this realm of individual selection? This first building block, sometimes an egg, damn, sometimes a chicken is an egg's way of making another egg. Sometimes what behavior is about is one individual trying to maximize the number of copies of their genes in the next generation, a natural selection manifestation of it being you're good at running away from predators. Selection for speed, for certain types of muscle metabolism, for certain sensory systems that will tell you there's somebody scary around. That would be the realm of that. Individual selection, selecting in the realm of sexual selection to have more of whatever those traits are that are attractive. So this first building block, it's not group selection, it's not behaving for the good of the species, it's behaving to maximize the number of copies of one's genes in the next generation, and the most straightforward way is to behave in a way to maximize the number of times you reproduce yourself.